Wow, thank you very much. Hello from Jerusalem. And I want to say to everyone who's coming together to listen to this, that I don't do this often, but the question that was asked was so profound, so important, and so relevant that I felt that we really have to treat it with deep respect in depth. And therefore, I would like to dedicate a whole session just to this question, which I'm going to read to you now. One of the Inner Circle members asked, quote, I've recently been reading Rabbi Kellerman's book and listening to his recorded lectures available on YouTube and other sources. While I find much of this extremely compelling, there is one hurdle I need to get over. I'd like to know the view the rabbi has on being gay, being married to a woman, etc. I'm afraid if I can't get past this, I can't take any of the rest of it seriously. Can one be a religious Jew and be gay? If not, those of us who know it's not a matter of changing one's nature are excluded from deep religious belief and practice. That was the question. And it's something that needs to be very seriously addressed. It's something that I'm trepidatious about addressing in current environment because so many people who have addressed this question have been so seriously sanctioned. However, the person who's asking is really sincere and really wants to know and can't be that an Orthodox rabbi is afraid to share Orthodox Judaism's perspective because of social sanction. That just can't be. So let's talk and let's go through this question carefully. I think that there are six very important points that need to be raised and even an introductory discussion. And I would consider this session really only an introductory discussion. I'm not going to get into much of what Judaism has to say about homosexuality. But if we're going to speak about the topic, there are six things that we need to discuss. And the first is this. I want to express my profound respect. I think we all have profound respect for this inner circle member who stepped forward and asked this question. You know, most people who out there just walk through life thoughtlessly. And then there are these special individuals who think through every aspect of their lives. They make calm and rational decisions about what's healthiest, what's the most ethical, etc. And then they act on those decisions and they take responsibility, being consistent in their behavior and accepting whatever reaction they receive from others, whether it's positive or negative. This, it's true heroism. So someone who's actually thinking about this issue and trying to make a decision about the issue. That person deserves our admiration. They have an absolute commitment to doing what's right, and they're fearless in the face of social sanction. They get kudos. I'll just add here that every person should make his own judgment about how to live his life. No one can make that decision for him. And that includes what country you live in and who you're going to marry and what career you're going to pursue. And yes, that also includes what religion you're going to practice. So I admire you, and I'm tremendously complimented that you're turning to me with a question of such personal significance to you. And I promise that I will do my best to answer accurately how I understand Orthodox Judaism holds on this subject, and I will say it without apologetics. When I was on my path early on, I had the privilege of having teachers who gave it to me straight, without any concern of whether I'd remain interested in Orthodox Judaism, whether they would lose me. And because of their integrity, I trusted them. And you deserve the same. So with that, I'll turn to my second observation. I want to express special admiration for you that you pose this question to specifically a representative of Orthodox Judaism. You you obviously know that there's a verse in Leviticus 18.22 that quotes God saying, Ve'et zachar lo tishkav mishkeve isha to'eva hi. A man should not cohabit with another man in the ways he cohabits with a woman. That would be an abomination. You know the verse. I know the verse. Everybody listening knows the verse. We're all aware that the Torah is not pro-homosexuality. And it's precisely because you're aware of this verse that you're asking. That's why you want to know, can somebody be a religious Jew and still violate one of God's commandments? And I'm going to take it a step further. You know that back in the year 2000, this is a long time ago, the Reform Movement's Central Conference of American Rabbis made history by becoming the first major group of North American clergy as an organization to give its support to those in its ranks choosing to perform 
same gender ceremonies. And in a politically strategic move, their resolution went out of its way to avoid calling these same-sex ceremonies marriages. Instead, what the reform movement did was they gave each individual reform rabbi the power to decide what his or her ceremony represents. It was very clever and careful, and it steered away from any sort of possible social sanction while still trying to demonstrate some loyalty to a book that has a verse that condemns homosexuality as an abomination. Okay, six years later, the conservative movement followed with a similarly clever response to homosexuality. The conservative movement's Committee on Jewish Law and Standards adopted two diametrically opposed responsa on the issue of sexual orientation, and then they declared that this permitted each conservative rabbi and rabbinical school to decide which response to adopt and hence set its own policy on the subject. So again, they took no position. Confronted with an explicit Torah verse prohibiting gay sex, each of these movements struggled to present a publicly acceptable position that wasn't too obviously a betrayal of the most fundamental Jewish book, the Torah. So even though you know that you could get the approval of a reform or a conservative rabbi for a gay or lesbian lifestyle, you're asking an Orthodox rabbi, and you have faith that this representative of Orthodoxy won't tell you something because I think that's what you want to hear. So that's very brave, and it shows enormous and very rare integrity, and it should be noted. You are not an ordinary person. You are a very, very unusual person. Okay, this leads me to my third consideration, and this provides the the crucial framework and the background for seriously addressing your question. The third point that I want to raise, and I'll say it first in terms of a question, is ultimately what makes something, what makes anything right or wrong? I'm going to give you an example. Assuming we both agree that it is and has, and has always been and always will be wrong to kill an innocent, non-threatening individual who doesn't want to die. That's a fairly simple case. We have a completely innocent person. They're non-threatening. They don't want to die. Assuming that it's wrong to kill them. Assuming that murder is wrong. This is the simplest case of murder. So we can reasonably ask, what makes it wrong? What makes murder immoral? So you're, you're aware, and as are many of the listeners, that I devoted the first chapter of my book, Permission to Believe, to this question. I'm going to review very, very briefly what I said there. I said, could it be that what's wrong with murder is I said so? Meaning, I, let's say, in this case, my name is Labe Kellerman, and what's wrong with murder? Labe Kellerman doesn't like murder. Is that, is that possibly why murder is wrong? And of course, it makes no sense because was, I was born in 1961. Was murder wrong in 1960? And at some point, I'm going to be dead. Will murder be wrong after I'm dead? And what unique trait do I possess that gives me more moral authority than anybody else on the planet. So I think everybody agrees that you can't say that murder is universally, eternally wrong because one particular individual said so. That makes no sense. Nothing could be right or wrong because some individual said so. So perhaps in order to achieve a universal ethic, what we have to do is we we have to appeal to a larger, more eternal body. Let's say that we deal with a country or a society. Maybe what's wrong with murder is the United States said so. But of course, that presents the problem. Was murder wrong in 1775? There was no United States. And if the United States ever fell, would murder then become okay? And what happens if the United States changed its mind and one day decided to vote for murder? It's happened in certain countries. If you would apply it to the specific case that we're dealing with, I'm not going to get into homosexuality yet, but let me just point out that last Saturday, voters in Taiwan voted down a same-sex marriage national referendum. The people of Taiwan said, we do not believe that same-sex marriage is the right thing to do. So does that make same-sex marriage wrong for everybody in the world? Because Taiwan said so? What would give one country the moral authority to tell everybody else what's right and what's wrong? Bring the point home a drop more. The United States of America officially considered homosexuality a classifiable disease until 1987. The first edition of the American Psychiatric Association's Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, the DSM-1, classified gay and lesbian orientations under the classification of paraphilia, a disease. The DSM-2, its updated version, called homosexual relations 
sexual orientation disturbance. The DSM-3 modified it to say it's ego dystonic homosexuality. Okay. It was first dropped as a disease in the United States with the publication of the DSM-3R, and that was in 1987. So before 1987, was homosexuality a disease because the official American Psychiatric Association, the representative body of the United States of America speaking out on on psychological issues, said that it's a disease? Did that make it a a disease? So none of us probably feel comfortable saying that the, the opinion of one country on the planet creates universal ethics. Perhaps the error that we're making is we're still appealing to too small of an entity. What about if we would say that what makes something right or wrong is that all of mankind agrees, or the majority of mankind, or something like that? So the, the obvious problem here is that there are times in world history where it certainly appears that mankind was not opposed to murder. When you dig up the paleobiological record, it seems like in the old days, when most people died not of natural causes, but because they had a club through the head or a spear through the heart. And there are times even in the modern era where it's not clear at all that the world was opposed to the extermination of a people. And that's not just referring to the Jews during the Holocaust. It's happened, unfortunately, many times around the planet where a people was being exterminated and the world couldn't care less. It seems like at times mankind's ethic was, as long as you don't do it to me, then I don't care what you do to somebody else. And when it comes to homosexuality, I don't know if it's any different. How many of the world's 195 countries permit homosexual marriage? So as of today, the answer is 27. In other words, less than 14% of the world's nations permit homosexual marriage. 86.15% of the world's countries ban homosexual marriage. So if we want to say that what makes something right or wrong is the opinion of mankind, it's going to be hard to say that murder is always wrong. It's certainly going to be hard to say that homosexual marriage is always right. And it'll be nearly impossible to come up with an internal ethic because the world's opinion could change any day. People live, people die. As populations change, as people change their minds, as PR campaigns are conducted, the world's opinion can shift 180 degrees. So it can't be that what makes something right or wrong is the opinion of all mankind. There's significant importance for our daily practical life as to what makes something actually right or wrong. So just let's carry this two steps further. If it's not the individual and it's not a country and it's not even all of mankind that makes something right or wrong, maybe the issue is that mankind is only one species. Perhaps mankind is not authoritative enough to actually determine an ethic. Maybe Ethics are determined by all living creatures. And what we do is we take a majority vote of all living creatures and they vote with their feet. They vote with their behavior. According to all living creatures, is murder wrong? So the ethic in nature seems to be survival of the fittest. If I need what you have in order for me to survive, then the rule is I kill you. And that is not just lions, tigers, and bears. That's bacteria. That's viruses. Virtually everything that's alive in the world today says that if I want your resources or if I want you, I'll kill you. And certainly it's going to be hard to make the case that if we would go based on a majority opinion of living creatures voting with their feet, that homosexuality is is the right way. Because although we do see homosexuality in in living creatures in, in many, many species, but it's rare. It's rare. It's never the rule. It's always the exception. So if we took a majority vote, homosexuality is not going to win there. So how do we know what's actually right and wrong? Maybe the error that we're making is that, again, we're, we're, we're appealing to a very small part of nature. We're only appe- appealing to that part of nature which is alive, the organic world. Maybe we have to include all of the inorganic world as well. Rocks and water and all the minerals. So if you ask nature, how do you feel about murder? How does gravity feel about murder? How does inertia feel about murder? When you start including all of nature, the rule is if you get in my way you're dead. So if there's something wrong with murder, which I think we agree that there's something wrong with killing innocent, non-threatening people who don't want to die. If there's something wrong with murder, it's not because nature said so. It's because nature was overruled. Something above nature said that nature's wrong. And there's a word in English for that which is above nature. It's called the supernatural. If murder's wrong, it's because something supernatural said so. 
there must be a supernatural moral authority that said murder's wrong. And that's where Judaism and ethical monotheism enter into the picture. The whole mission of Judaism has been to posit that there is a God, a moral arbiter, who tells us that we shouldn't behave like inorganic nature or like all living creatures or like all mankind votes on any given day or like any particular country feels or like some individual feels. Judaism enters to say there's a God and he is the the source for the universal ethic of what is right and what is wrong. Okay, now, let's just play with this for a moment. Think about what a wacky religion Judaism appears to be when you open up the Torah, right? It starts off with God telling the father of the entire Jewish nation, Abraham, to take his son, his only son, the one he loves, and kill him. Isaac was perfectly innocent. So why did God command that? Does God support murdering innocent people? And and what lesson are we supposed to glean from God then backtracking and stopping Abraham from completing the murder a moment beforehand? So according to the Jewish tradition, the answer is that Abraham was famous for his trait of kindness. He was naturally an extraordinarily kind person. And God tested Abraham by telling him to act cruelly. The question that God put to Abraham was, what makes an act right or wrong? Abraham, do you think your opinion about ethics is somehow superior to everybody else's opinion? That your opinion creates an ethic for all of mankind? Or are universal ethics only possible when there's a God who said so? In which case, the only thing that counts is what God said. So, of course, we all know the PS on this story. Abraham passed the test by recognizing that something can only be universally right or wrong if God said so. And once Abraham recognized that, then it was over. God could tell him that, coincidentally, Abraham's initial intuition happened to have been correct and murder is wrong and you should not kill your son. And that's how the story ends But Abraham had to be prepared to abandon his natural inclination and his perspective. This religion's mandate, which can be excruciatingly difficult to accept, is to affirm God's universal ethical standard, regardless of whether that ethic fits the conduct of nature, the conduct of most living creatures, the conduct of the majority of mankind, the opinion of my country or my society, or even my opinion. I have to learn that the only voice that counts is God's. Okay, now, this would explain an otherwise bizarre rabbinical passage that is recorded in the Medrash. This is a tradition which is at least 2,000 years old. The Medrash in Shir Hashirim Rabbah, in the very beginning of Shir Hashirim Rabbah, records, Avraham mamarer atzmo umesagev atzmo biasurim. Avraham made his life, his own life, bitter and tortured himself with various types of torture. So, of course, uh, what any Orthodox Jew would immediately ask is, hey, wait a minute, Uh, the Torah forbids uh, recreationally torturing yourself. You're not allowed for fun to stick pins into your hand. You can't cause yourself pain recreationally. And yet here we have the father of the Jewish nation who tortured himself. Mamarer umsagif atzmo. What was he doing? So one of the most articulate Talmudic scholars from before World War II, Rabbi Yeruchim Levavitz of the Mir, gave a talk at the Mir Yeshiva, which uh, was written down. It's recorded in a book called Da'as Hachma Umusar in the second volume on page 76. And there, what he says is this. He says that what was the torture that Avram was involved in? It wasn't recreational. It's that Avraham, like any normal person, was a bundle of natural inclinations and habits. And what Avram Avinu did was he inventoried every single inclination and habit he had, asking, is this particular habit consistent with God's will? And each time he ran into something in his own self, which was inconsistent with God's will, then he changed it. Okay, now I just said that so quickly. He changed it. But of course, everyone who's listening who has ever tried to combat a habit knows that it's not so easy. You don't just change it. I'm going to confess that well through my 20s, from the time I was a little boy until well through my 20s, I bit my fingernails. And at a certain point, I had a conversation with a great Talmudic scholar here in Jerusalem. 
His name was Rabbi Shlomo Zalman Orbach. He passed away now, but he was an extraordinary human being. And I was talking with him and it came out that biting your fingernails is inconsistent with God's vision of a noble, refined human being. And he said, if someone bites their fingernails, they really should try to stop. So I walked out of Rosh Hashanah Zalman Orbach's house and I realized, okay, you buy this thing, you're into it, you, you accept it, then you got to stop biting your fingernails. But it wasn't so easy. Now, I, I, I actually didn't bite my fingernails from that day forward. However, so if you looked at my fingernails, everything looked good. But if you could see what was happening inside of me, I was under extraordinary stress. It was so difficult for me. And how many times a day did I lift my finger up to my mouth, almost bite it, put it down, almost bite it again, put it down, almost bite it again. It was agonizing. Anyone who's ever broken any habit, anyone who's ever been through a 12-step program, anyone who's ever tried to combat their habits and their nature knows that it is excruciating. And Avram Avinu didn't do this with just one habit. He did this with every single habit and inclination he had. Avram Avinu tortures himself in order to build himself into a noble human being. So as, as I wrap up point number three, what makes something right or wrong? Logically, one must conclude that the only thing that could actually create a universal eternal ethic would be a universal eternal authority. And the only universal eternal authority that we could imagine that would actually consistently condemn murder would be a God. So if you and I think that there's something wrong with murder, and again, I'm not telling anybody there's something wrong with murder, but if you and I agree that there's something wrong with killing innocent, non-threatening people who don't want to die, then we have to admit that the only possible way that could be would be if God said so. Point number four, and this follows directly on the heels of what we just concluded. It's important to note that Avraham was naturally inclined towards kindness, and therefore he was specifically commanded to act cruelly towards his son. Okay, now, why did God push him specifically against his nature? So there was a an 18th century Kabbalist by the name of Moshe Chaim Lutzato. And he explained that God wants to give us the greatest possible gift. And the greatest possible gift is the opportunity to be like him. After all, God's perfect. So when we look at God's character traits, then we know what perfection looks like. Okay, one of God's traits is he's supernatural. He is in no way bound by nature. Think about this for a minute. Nature, by definition, is limiting. And God hovers above that world of natural bonds. So for us to become like him, we too have to have the freedom to rise above our nature. And this is the opportunity and the mission that God gave us in the Torah. We have to believe that we're not bound by our nature, and then we have to follow the Torah's guidelines in order to transcend it. That's what Avram was doing when he broke all of his habits. And that also explains why specifically he who was so kind was tested with a cruel commandment. And that also explains, tighten your seatbelt, why his wife, Sarah, was born with no womb. According to the Talmud, the Gemara Nyavamos, it says that Avram's wife, Sarah, had no womb. She was not capable of conceiving. And yet God commanded her, I want you to conceive and I want you to give birth to the Jewish nation. She was told to do something that she was physically incapable of doing. Now, for it was impossible for Sarah to give birth. For Sarah to give birth, it would require... a um, a miracle. Okay, comes the Torah and tells us, you got to believe in miracles. And you have to follow the Torah formula for trying to create those miracles. The, the belief in the world generally has been throughout history that there's nature and that's the wall and you'll never get over it. And once you're staring at nature, you are looking at the end of the story. And the Torah comes with a revolution and says, no, you are not bound by your nature. You can rise above your nature. Sar was commanded to have children. She grew a womb. Okay, now this sounds, this sounds so far out, so sci-fi that it's hard to relate to. So let me bring it all the way down and make it very, very concrete. I'm going to give you an example from my university years. It is natural to cave into authority. In, in university, when I was at UCLA, in an undergraduate psych class, we were asked to study Stanley Milgram's 1950s experiment uh, conducted at Yale. You all know the experiment well. Uh, Yale students, later staff, and later just citizens around the Connecticut area were asked to give, as part of a psychological experiment, uh, electric shocks to a completely innocent human being. And 
uh, the shocks started at a very low level. They started at, at, at 15 volts, and then they increased to 30 volts, and then 45 volts, and 60 volts, and 75 volts. And the, the real subject, the focus of this experiment was the person throwing the switches. The only thing the person throwing the switches did not know was that the person he was shocking in the other room was actually not getting shocks at all. He was an actor who was working on Stanley Milgram's staff. And the whole point of the experiment was to see how far would a normal person go in causing terrible pain, or in the case of this experiment, death to perfectly innocent people. And Stanley Milgram would stand over the subject in, wearing his white coat and with authority say, you must throw the next switch. You must throw the next switch. I take full responsibility, throw the next switch. Now, of course, this whole experiment was conducted in the 1950s in the shadow of the Holocaust. And the whole goal was to find out like, what happened in Europe. You know, was there something in the water in Poland? Did the people in Germany right, suffer from mass hysteria? What, what took place there? How was it that Europe all conspired to kill millions and millions of innocent people. And Stanley Milgram had a theory, which was that it's part of human nature to give in to authority, to cave to authority. So I, I want, because we're trying to get a handle here on what it means to rise above nature, I want to read to you just a few paragraphs from Milgram's book. Milgram wrote up the whole experiment in a book called Obedience to Authority. And these are his words. He says, a reader's initial reaction to the experiment may be to wonder why anyone in his right mind would administer even the first shocks. Would he not simply refuse and walk out of the lab? But the fact is, no one ever does. What is surprising is how far ordinary individuals will go in complying with the experimenter's instructions. Many subjects will obey the experimenter no matter how vehement the pleading of the person being shocked, no matter how painful the shocks seem to be, and no matter how much the victim pleads to be let out. This was seen time and again in our studies and has been observed in several universities where the experiment was repeated. It is the extreme willingness of adults to go to almost any lengths on the command of an authority that constitutes the chief finding of the study and the fact most urgently demanding explanation. I want to read to you just one more passage from Milgram. He writes, A commonly offered explanation is that those who shocked the victim at the most severe levels were monsters, the sadistic fringe of society. But if one considers that almost two-thirds of the participants fall into the category of obedient subjects and that they represented ordinary people drawn from working, managerial, and professional classes, that argument becomes very shaky. This is perhaps the most fundamental lesson of our study, he concludes. Ordinary people simply doing their jobs and without any particular hostility on their part can become agents in a terrible destructive process. Moreover, even when the destructive effects of their work become patently clear and they're asked to carry out actions incompatible with fundamental standards of morality, relatively few people have the resources needed to resist authority. Sitting back in one's arms chair, it is easy to condemn the actions of the obedient subjects. But those of us who condemn the subjects measure them against the standard of their own ability to formulate high-minded moral prescriptions. That is hardly a fair standard. Many of the subjects at the level of stated opinion feel quite as strongly as any of us about the moral requirement of refraining from action against a helpless victim. They too, in general terms, know what ought to be done and can state their values when the occasion arises. But this has little, if anything, to do with their actual behavior under the pressure of circumstances. End quote from Stanley Milgram. In other words, it is perfectly natural to become a Nazi. It is perfectly natural for two-thirds of Yale undergrads majoring in psychology, a helping profession, to apply such powerful shocks to their friends that they thought they had killed them. It's perfectly natural to get angry when someone doesn't do what you want. It's natural under some circumstances to drink too much, to drive too fast. When we discover that we have a natural inclination, that only helps us get to know our starting point. It doesn't limit who we could become. And we can safely say that every single person whom you admire Every person you admire, without exception, transcended his or her nature in some very significant way, and that's why you admire them. So we intuitively sense that when we're looking at the wall of nature in front of us, we, we feel that we can climb over it. And the Torah comes and confirms that and says, yes, you're right. There's such a thing as the supernatural. And God, who reigns over the supernatural, 
lowers his hand to lift anybody above their natural bonds if that's what they want. Okay, now we're ready to address the issue. Point number five, can one be a religious Jew and be gay or lesbian? And I'm not going to answer apologetically, and I am going to answer accurately, as accurately as I can, given my limited knowledge. First, we should distinguish between the way the Torah itself relates to heterosexuality and different types of homosexuality. And I would divide the way that the Torah relates to sexuality into three categories. First, heterosexual marriage is considered to be kadosh. We usually translate that as holy. It's a great thing. It's fantastic. It's ideal. It's holy. In fact, the name for heterosexual marriage in Hebrew is kedushin, from the word kadosh, holy. Heterosexual marriage is holy. Level two, lesbianism, sexual relations between women, is never described as holy. And level three, male homosexuality is explicitly forbidden. So there's three different spiritual levels here. One is ideal. Another, on the extreme opposite end, is forbidden. So now against that framework, we then have to analyze three different mindsets that somebody could carry into anything that they are going to do which is inconsistent with the Torah. The first mindset, the most innocent of mindsets, is that sometimes a person is just overwhelmed. They're overwhelmed by desire. They know it's the wrong thing, but they do the wrong thing now and then. The second mindset is a person might be overwhelmed by desire consistently. Now, this person doesn't reject God's existence or deny the Torah. They're not rebelling against God. It's just that he or she is facing a really tough test, a, a test so tough that for whatever reason, they don't pass it. They never pass it. They consistently do the wrong thing. But it's not because they're rebelling against God or they deny God or they deny that God wrote the Torah. They just don't pass this test. There's a third level, and that's a person might do something because of desire or even without desire, just because it's forbidden, just to demonstrate that I don't accept God's existence or I don't accept the divinity of the Torah or I will not be bound by any authority beyond myself. So Jewish law treats the first two people who are not rebellious at all and they believe in God and they're not trying to deny the divinity of the Torah. It treats those two people very differently than the third who is trying to deny God's existence or fighting with God. I'll give you an example of this in uh, a modern response from one of, one of the greatest uh, of modern halachic authorities within the Orthodox world, a very famous rabbi, Rabbi Moshe Feinstein. Rabbi Feinstein passed away now, but he wrote in, in a letter, which was recorded in his responsum. You can see in, in his book is called Igris Moshe. And if you look in Igris Moshe in, in, the, in the section on Orachim, volume three, responsum 21, you'll see that he says that we so thoroughly as a community, embrace the first two categories of individuals, those people who, they're innocent. They're not not trying to deny God or fight with God. They're not trying to deny the divinity of the Torah. We embrace those people so thoroughly that we could give them the highest honors in a community. We could call them up to the Torah for an aliyah, etc. And Ramosha Feinstein even writes there that we should especially consider such a thing in a case where failing to do so could lead to terrible misunderstandings of our feelings towards them. It could lead to fights. It could lead to people feeling rejected. In those cases, it's very, very important that we make clear that we embrace these Jews. They, 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 they're, they're not making war on God. They're not doing... They've, people do things wrong. That's normal. A, 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 a person who violates the verse forbidding homosexuality is, in this way, no different than a person who violates the verse prohibiting driving to shul on Shabbos, or a person who violates the many verses that prohibit gossiping about our friends and neighbors. Right? Those are all prohibited by the Torah. But come on, man, none of us are perfect. We're all in process. And when someone either now and then or even consistently commits some sin, some they do something that Torah prohibits, but it's not being done to fight with God, it's not being done to deny God. It's not being done to deny the validity of the Torah. So that person is thoroughly and fully embraced by our community. This this now leads up to one last very practical consideration. So if somebody is homosexual, whether they're gay or lesbian, whatever the case is, 
it, it doesn't make a difference in what way they're violating the Torah ideal. We bring them into our communities and we love them. Um, and we even honor them, as Ramosha Feinstein wrote. So given that's the case, that's the responsibility, the Torah ideal, the responsibility of the Torah community. What's the other half of this contract? How should homosexual couples conduct themselves when they're in an Orthodox shul? So the answer is so simple and so logical and so reasonable. Homosexual couples should conduct themselves in an Orthodox shul in the exact same way that heterosexual couples conduct themselves. The Orthodox perspective is not that a shul is a social environment. It's not a, a place to party. A shul is a place to come and speak to God. We go there to talk to God. We don't go there to socialize or to hang out with each other. That's why God said that even heterosexual couples shouldn't sit next to each other in a shul. And not only should they not sit together, they should be separated by a barrier called a mechitza. And even outside of a shul, you'll see that Orthodox couples generally don't express romance or physical affection in public. There's a perspective that some things are so private, they belong behind closed doors. The Orthodox perspective has always been that sexuality is extraordinary. It's one of the most powerful tools we have to draw close to God, and therefore, it belongs at home, behind closed doors. It's no one's business, and we don't display it in public. And since that is the approach that heterosexual couples take within the Orthodox community, it would be bizarre if someone would advocate that homosexual couples should act differently. We just don't show romantic affection in mixed company when others are around. So there's a lot, a lot, a lot to say that I didn't say. I didn't ask why might it be that the Torah comes out against, certainly against male homosexuality. Lesbianism is also not considered to be holy. I didn't discuss at all why that is, and I'd be happy to, to discuss that at another time. But you asked a powerful question. You said, if I can't get over this hurdle, if there's no room to be a religious Jew and, and, and someone who's gay or lesbian, then there's no place for me within orthodoxy. And here's what I said. Point number one, you deserve everyone's admiration for thinking about this issue, not just falling into life. And you deserve our admiration for being so committed to doing whatever's right that you asked and you're open to hearing and you're thinking through the issue. You're listening with an open, in, with an open mind. The second point that I made, you're brave and you show tremendous integrity by bringing this question specifically to an orthodox rabbi whom you know must tell you the truth and who's bound by a timeless, unchanging Torah. I've got a verse that I can't walk away from. And yet you asked me anyways. That is brave. That is integrity. Three, we said if anything is universally right or wrong, it can't be because people said so or a country said so or even all of mankind or nature. If something's universally right or wrong, it's only because God said so. My personal opinion just isn't relevant. And therefore, if I'm going to be a person who believes in universal rights and wrongs, then I have to be open to finding out, did God ever say whether homosexuality is right or wrong? How does God feel about it? And then I have to be open to adjusting my opinion to his opinion. Point number four, we said the human mission is to reinvent ourselves, rising above our nature whenever it conflicts with God's idea. This is really tough, really tough, sometimes agonizing. But you know what? That's what we get paid for. And if we struggle to do the right thing, we're not only guaranteed success, but we're guaranteed to become different sorts of creatures, to experience a spirituality which is beyond anything that could be experienced. In. Point number five, yes, the answer to your question. One can be a religious Jew and a homosexual, just like one can be a religious Jew and give in to desires to do all sorts of other things which are prohibited by the Torah. You can be a religious Jew and drive to shul on Shabbos, and you could be a religious Jew, but you have this thing, you're not willing to give up pork yet. As long as I'm not rebelling against God, as, I'm not, as long as I'm not saying, you know what, the Torah actually permits pork, or I'm saying that the Torah is not valid, if I, as long as I'm not denying the whole thing. So yes, I'm a perfect religious Jew, meaning a perfect religious Jew insofar as I am in process, I'm struggling. Am I living up to the whole ideal yet? No. But how many of us are living up to the ideal? We're all in process. We all face tough requests every day. And what's so heroic about this religion is that we don't change the rules just because it's really, really hard. I don't need to always be perfect. It's okay for me not. Meaning I can accept that I'm failing in some arena and I haven't lived up to God's ideal. I don't have to change the ideal. And point number six, affection belongs in the bedroom, not in the public arena, regardless of homosexual or heterosexual orientation. It just doesn't make a difference. It's not something that we display publicly. So bottom line is yes, 
there's a place for every single Jew in the world of Orthodox Judaism. That was God's intention. And there's an obligation on the community to honor every single Jew, and there's an obligation on those of us who are not living up to the ideal, not to proudly display it in front of them. And certainly when it comes to sexuality, that's something that certainly belongs. Okay, we took a long time to give really only an introductory overview, but I want to take your question very, very seriously. You deserve this sort of treatment. And uh, I hope that uh, those who tune in to uh, future Inner Circle sessions uh, will enjoy going through the many, many questions that we handle every week. And I look forward to, to speaking with you all in the future on many, many topics. David, thank you. And thank you to all the people who joined me tonight. Um, I look forward to our next session together.